All right. I'm just going to wait about one minute uh, to start this, but we are live and thank you for being here. Uh, give me about, you know, 60 seconds and we'll start this. Just going to wait for a few people to trickle in. As you know, I like to start on time. So looking forward to another wonderful week together. Oh, good morning, um, Jane. Uh, thank you for the uh, comment about uh, Rick. I'll talk about it here in a little bit just to start off. So, All right, it's uh, 10 o'clock on the dot, my friends. Uh, I see some of you are already on. I appreciate it. Thank you for your, um, uh, you know, just being here on time. And I'm looking forward to another wonderful family education and support program for you. And for anyone else that, that uh, is interested in watching this, good morning, Denise. Thank you for being here. Um, this one's kind of good. This one's, uh, it's a mix of recovery and personal development. So uh, if you're here watching this because you have a loved one in treatment uh, or you're just trying to learn a little bit more about addiction, recovery, sobriety, the whole mental health space, this is a wonderful talk. And if simultaneously you're also trying to improve yourself, self-improvement, personal development, to be able to achieve some personal goals in your life, this will be one that's in hybrid. So there's going to be value for all different types of people watching this. And before we start this one, I think it would um, it's appropriate for me, and, and Jane wrote something there about our colleague, uh, Rick. So uh, for those of you who do know Rick, uh, Rick was uh, a friend of mine, uh, a colleague of ours at Buckeye Recovery Network. Uh, before that, he was with Orange County Recovery Services. Uh, he'd actually been with the company for nine years, so uh, a friend, a colleague, a brother. Um, two days after um, Christmas, he was taken into the hospital due to complications with uh, COVID-19. And unfortunately, on Wednesday of this past week, uh, he, he passed away in the hospital. So it's been a rough week for a lot of us, um, uh, company-wise, the sober community, and um, I just wanted to make sure that I honored him. You know, I was looking back through some of my old footage on the talk that we had on January 2nd. There was a bunch of interactions with me and Rick going back and forth. He was watching the same talk that we're on right now in the hospital bed on his cell phone. So even in there, he was trying to stay connected and try to improve himself. So uh, thoughts and prayers to him and uh, his, his son, Austin. I would appreciate it. Uh, if you do know Rick or if you're interested about knowing more, if you go on Buckeye Recovery Network, I have a post there. Uh, that is a GoFundMe for Austin. Austin, for those of you who don't know, uh, is a Rick's son. Uh, Rick raised him as a single father. Austin is graduating high school this year. So, um, and I, I love and adore that kid. So uh, feel free to go check that out. But all that being said, um, just wanted to make sure I, I address that first before getting into the talk today. So today, um, there was a request last week. Actually, I got a text message um, from a someone that's been watching these for a long, long time now. And the text message was to say, I would really appreciate it if you talked a little bit about chronic anxiety and worry. So I'm going to go ahead and just start with that today. Uh, and then I'm going to get into my talk because uh, I think chronic anxiety and worry is something that many of the family members watching this have experienced in their life. And sometimes they want to attribute it just to the addiction of their loved one. However, People that tend to have chronic anxiety and tend to worry about one thing, they tend to do it about other things too. So I want to go, if you are someone that experiences a lot of anxiety in life and you're someone that constantly is worried in life, I want to go ahead and kind of hopefully help you understand the roots of it and how it happens and what we do as human beings to try to cope with it and how it shows up later on in life and why these cycles keep repeating themselves. So. Uh, first of all, chronic anxiety is something that's, uh, that's it's, it's always there, all right? It's, it's, it's not based on circumstance. It's not based on situation. For example, when the pandemic hit, a lot of people started to feel some circumstantial anxiety about, oh my God, what's going to happen to my job? What's going to happen to my health? What's going to happen to the economy? Are things ever going to go back to being the way they were? That's a circumstantial situational anxiety. 
Now, chronic anxiety is something that the individual feels at all times, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the situation. And that person tends to constantly worry, which leads to the anxiety, which leads to the physiological symptoms they experience. So let me tell you this. This is my best version, best way I can explain what chronic anxiety is and where it gets originated. So if you are someone that experiences chronic anxiety, I, I want you to go back to a time in your life then and there, so not right now, then and there, that you first started to experience something like anxiety, something that just didn't feel right. It was like a blanket that was wrapped around you that was like, ugh, something's different. Most people go back to a time in their childhood or early development, and I'll give you an example. So if mom and dad inside the home are yelling and fighting with each other, and no one's coming down to explain to the child what's going on, the child is going to start to feel anxious. They're going to start to feel worried. They're going to start to feel scared. And that's like a first introduction of anxiety. Sometimes when a child moves around a lot as a, as a kid, different school, different place, different setting, different situation, they start to experience this thing called anxiety. Sometimes when, you know, in some of our countries, there was revolutions or their people got uprooted and people had to leave their homes. And, and you know, we experienced a lot of anxiety, right? So anxiety is a natural phenomenon that happens to circumstances, situations, environments around us. That's why some anxiety is good, by the way. However, if as a child, nobody comes and explains to the child, tells the child what's going on with you. This is what's happening. No one's communicating to them. No one's having a full authentic communication with what their internal experience is, guess what the child is going to do? They're going to start thinking and overthinking and overthinking and overthinking. They're going to start playing out different possible scenarios, outcomes, situations. They're going to start overanalyzing everything, right? Chronic anxiety people, you know what I'm talking about. You tend to overanalyze and over critically think over and over again, repetitively over things because there's this phrase called overthinking, overanalyzing separates the body from the mind. So what does that mean? When a child is scared because mom and dad are fighting, they're feeling something inside their gut that they're feeling fear. Now, when you start thinking and start over-processing thoughts in your mind, what happens is when you think, you separate from the body, so you're not feeling anymore. So for people that have chronic anxiety, thinking is a form of coping skill. It's almost like a drug to avoid them from feeling. Last week, Jane said the longest distance a person travels is from here to here. You wanna know why people go up here? Because they don't wanna feel what's down here. So my best suggestion, advice to anybody that's a chronic warrior, to anyone that's a, that experiences chronic anxiety, is to be able to sit with your discomfort, sit with your negative emotions, and not do anything. Because this does something. Right? Because you always have the tendency to fix and change and analyze and control and try to predict and all that kind of stuff like that, which is what you had to do as a child because that was a coping skill. But now as an adult, when you're experiencing some type of anxiety, when you're experiencing some type of fear, to learn how to just sit with that discomfort. And when you sit with that discomfort, you'll learn something. You'll realize something that's very, very, very powerful. You'll see that you didn't need to change it. You didn't need to adjust it. You didn't need to do anything with it. And the level goes down. And now all of a sudden you have two versions of reality. One version is to overthink, uh, overworry, chronically, you know, dissect and analyze things. And the other one is just to be with, just to sit with, just to just let it be. And for the first time in a long time, you're going to realize something that you have a different version of dealing with circumstances, situations, and events. And that's just to be, because remember this, we are meant, we are, we are geared to be these things called human beings, not human doings, not human thinkings, human beings. When you just be with discomfort, you're able to find more solutions than you can with your worrying mind. So I hope some of that made sense. So if you are someone that, you know, that you asked me this question about chronic anxiety, your anxiety that you're experiencing in the here and now, the originating root of it happened then and there, and you use your thinking creative thinking, analytical mind to be able to cope with the feelings that you had. And you probably take careers, you take jobs, you take relationships that you can always stay in that same critical thinking mind. But when you're stuck sitting by yourself and you start to feel things, you start to get uncomfortable. And that's where the work begins to be able to get comfortable within that discomfort, because that's where the chronic anxiety and the, and the worrying starts to 
decrease the level of severity and the, and the overwhelming sensations of it. So uh, feel free to write me more questions about that and I'll be able to define <clears throat> or explain a little bit better. So that being said, let me scroll down here. Uh, what's up everyone? Sorry, I was, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you for the uh, condolences. I just saw those messages. Um, absolutely praying for Austin and, and thank you for taking the time to, to write those kind words. So today we are going to talk about something, like I said, that's not only beneficial in the recovery process for you as a family member or someone in the program, it's also beneficial for you trying to advance and achieve certain goals, gain some success, uh, move forward in life in regards to personal development. <clears throat> so this one is talk is titled appropriately to raise your standards and change your life. Now, who wouldn't want to change their life, right? Everybody watching this, there is some area in your life that you want to change. Now, some of you, the most obvious one, if you're a family member with a loved one in our program, you're trying to change uh, your loved one's addiction or your relationship towards your loved one's addiction. Uh, you're trying to uh, learn more about addiction, learn more about recovery, learn more about mental health. That's all obvious. But if you're a human being like I am and like the other 7 billion people, 8 billion people in the world, there are areas in your life that you're trying to change. Ways you think about yourself, look at yourself, feel about yourself, whatever that is. And in order to do so, I'm telling you this, that you have to learn how to raise your standards if you want to change your life. So that's what this whole premise of this talk is going to be like. It's really powerful. And I'll make sure that I relate it to recovery as well to make sure that you're getting the content that you want. And I'll make sure that I relate it to personal development also to, so I know that I'm giving you what you need to make the first part stick. Okay. So the first question that I like to always ask is you have to get clear and you have to be able to define what success means to you and what failure means to you. This is a very, very broad definition because if there's 10 people watching this right now and about 100 people that are going to watch this later, if they sat down and wrote down what success means to them, there hopefully will be 10 different definitions or 100 different def definitions of the word success. And failure is the same way because as human beings with the individuality that we have, we all have different meanings for that. For somebody watching this, success might be being able to be comfortable, at peace, serene with their loved one's addiction, with their recovery, feeling like they don't need to change it, control it, they know they can't cure it, to be able to engage with certain things for themselves, for their lives, for their health, for their well-being. For someone watching this, success might be to be able to finally have their business scale into uh, you know, uh, double the size, be able to make more income, be able to provide more for their family, to be able to save some for retirement. For some people, success might be to be able to get an optimal health and shape and, 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 um, and spiritually fit and whatever it is, I don't care. You have to be able to define what that is for you. So if you're looking at recovery and sobriety, find out what you want to get out of these family education support stuff and get clear with it. Because when you get clear with what success is for you, everything else that doesn't fall in that bubble is stuff that you can avoid and stop putting your energy, effort, and focus on. So... Once you get clear with that, and by the way, our definitions are so different because, like I said, uh, as human beings, we all have different backgrounds. For example, I was born in Iran, right? I was born in Iran during a, a, a nasty war between Iran and Iraq, and my family was able to immigrate to the United States. So being born in a war zone, there's a certain level of baseline anxiety between myself, my family, my life, my, my environment that I was probably exposed to. Coming to the United States as an immigrant, there's a certain a feeling that you get when you go to classes and schools and and there's a certain chip that gets put on your shoulder and and then I move back to Iran and there's a lot of like bullying and there's a lot of uh, fear and anxiety and all that kind of stuff and then coming back here I went through addiction you know I, I had to get clean and sober I went to psychologists psychiatrists I couldn't stop drinking I finally get sober all of these life experiences that I have they they create and form and shape the world that I view so my definition of success based on my life experience is going to be different than yours watching this. But you need to get clear with what that definition of success is for you. Sorry, I'm, I'm repeating this so many times because I do believe that a lot of people go through life and unfortunately, they don't know what success is for them. Because if you don't know what success is for you, how are you ever going to know when you got it? How are you ever going to know when you've achieved success if you don't even know what that means to you? 
So please take some time after this to define it for yourself. And when you're trying to raise your standards in life, this is what you need to do. And feel free to take notes of this stuff. I mean, this is really good stuff. We all have a list of shoulds. Okay, so you're sitting this, I should learn more about recovery. I should call my loved one a little bit more. I should go to the gym. I should exercise. I should eat healthier. I should stop smoking. I should save my money more. I should do some more community service, volunteer work. I should sleep more. I should drink more water. I don't know what your shoulds are. Each one of you watching this right now, when you wake up in the morning, there is a list of shoulds that goes through your mind until the time you go to sleep at night. Now, if you're trying to change your standards to change your life, what you need to do is you have to change your shoulds into musts. Change your should into must. So it becomes, I must learn more about recovery. I must engage in self-care. I must exercise more. I must eat healthier. I must drink water. I must get some rest. So many people go through life with just shoulds. And what happens, by the way, when we don't do something we said we should do? So just think about it. So many of you are watching this right now and you said, hey, I should eat healthier. Right? But then all of a sudden you eat something really, really bad. Afterwards, you feel guilt. You feel shame. Because not doing something you should do produces us with automatic guilt. And I'm telling you, when you add the word, I must eat healthier, because you've woken up and realized that there is a sense of urgency connected to it. A sense of urgency. When you must do something, you don't wake up. There's no other option. There's one choice, and that choice is to do what you must do. And the more you're able to change your shoulds into musts, the more your standards in life are going to change. And when your standards in life change, your life changes. This is some powerful stuff, my friend. So, um, all of us watching this, you look at the life you have, everything that you have is a direct correlation to the standards that you have set for yourself. Everything that you are experiencing in life right now is a byproduct of the standards that you have allowed yourself to have. I know that's hard to hear sometimes because a lot of us want to think that, you know, we're, we're, this has nothing to do with being a good person or a bad person. A good person can have some really low standards. You know, and a bad person could have some really high standards. So the standards that you have set for yourself have produced and have created the quality of life that you have right now. So talking about the addiction recovery space, last week we talked about boundaries. If you didn't watch that one, go watch it. The standards that you set for yourself, what will you ex expect, accept and not accept in life, is the life that you experience. So some of you have had some really, really low standards, right? Really low standards for yourself and your, the addiction of your loved one over years, over time. And the loved one keeps screwing you over, keeps relapsing, keeps taking advantage of you. And you want to get frustrated at the loved one. You got to get frustrated at the disease of addiction. You want to get frustrated at the fact that they just don't get it. When in reality, you have to look at yourself and say, what standard have I allowed for my life to have? It has nothing to do with them. You know, what standards have you allowed yourself to set? Because that's the world you're going to experience. So the body that you have right now is a direct relation to your standards. The physical body you have is the standards that you've set for yourself. So what you eat, what you consume, if you're overweight, if you're underweight, if you don't exercise, if you... Uh, abuse your body with drugs and alcohol, those are all standards that you have allowed to have for yourself. Standards that you've allowed. It has nothing to do with anyone else. Your bank account. So some people watching this might have big bank accounts. Some people might have small bank accounts. I was just doing this talk for you know the, your loved ones earlier this morning, the same talk with the same level of passion and intensity. And you know a lot of them aren't really doing that well financially. And I told them, hey, you look at your bank account that whatever number you see there, that's the standard that you've accepted in your life. You know, you go and you overdraft and withdraw and, and, and $34 at a time, the bank's taken from you and you want to sit back and say, I'm pissed off because the bank keeps taking my money and they keep hitting me with overdraft charges. Stop blaming the bank. You're responsible for that. It's your standard. You've set it for yourself. So as a family member, if you're struggling with budgeting, if you're struggling with finances, 
you got to look and see what standard you've allowed yourself to create. The relationships in your life, this one's important. So one of the relationships in your life is the relationship you have with your loved one that's in treatment. The quality of that relationship is 100% correlated to the standards that you've accepted. Right? Some people are in toxic relationships. Some people are in abusive relationships. Some people are in relationships over an extended period of time that they continue to relive the same pain, the same agony. And what they want to do, and this they often do, is they start to say, hey, hopefully this person is going to change or they want to blame this or blame that or not take responsibility for it. When you got to look and see what standards of relationship have you allowed to happen in your life, right? So when you learn how to change your standards, you actually gain an opening to change your life. And the last one is the quality of life you have. I don't know many of you that well. I know some of you through passing through a quick phone call. I know some of you through a message here, you know, on, um, on Facebook or something like that, but I don't know many of you, but you all know yourself and you know the quality of life that you have. And you can look around and look at all different areas of your life, mind, body, spirit, relationships, health, recovery, sobriety, family addiction, family recovery, whatever it is. All of that, all of that is a byproduct of your standards. It's what you've accepted into your life and what you've been okay with and what you've resigned to. That's the saddest part, by the way. Some people bring their standards down so low, so low. They bring the bar down so low and they just resign to that fact that that's where their standards are. That's what their life's going to be. I know that's not you because you wouldn't be watching me talk about this topic if you said that I was okay with this. You want more. You want to feel better. You want to do better. You want to raise your standards. You got to change these shoulds into musts. Like I should set boundaries. I must set boundaries. There is a difference between those two worlds. I should eat healthier. I must eat healthier. There is a difference between two, those two worlds. I should work my own program as a family member. I should go to Al-Anon meetings. I should read the literature. I should reach out to other family members. I should help out other human beings. I must work my own program. I must go to Al-Anon meetings. I must do my own work. I must reach out to other people. These are two different worlds. The world of the must is a much higher standard and it produces better results. Um, so now I'm talking about these standards. So I just kind of I've hopefully shared enough about how powerful these standards are. By the way, if anybody has any questions, I know I'm talking super passionately about this, but if you have any questions or you want me to pause or if you just need more clarification on any of these things, or if you want to talk about something completely different, just write it there and I'll make sure we address it today, okay? So the question is this. So hopefully by now you understand that we all have standards. Now I want you to think about when and where did you set those standards for yourself? When and where did you set those standards for yourself? And I'll tell you this, your standards didn't just start with the addiction of your loved one. Your standards did not just start when they started drinking and using. Human beings set their standards long before then, long before then. When a child, for example, um, goes through life and goes through challenges and goes through adversity. So when let's just say a kid has a learning disability, has dyslexia, has ADHD, is sitting in the classroom and even though they're trying their hardest to learn, they're unable to grasp and retain the information and people are calling them stupid or they start feeling like they're stupid. They feel like they're dumb. They're not good enough. Maybe that same child or another child is going through life and experiencing psychological, physical, emotional, sexual abuse. Maybe a child is going through life feeling neglected, feeling abandoned, actually being neglected, being abandoned. When there's a child going on through life that gets in a relationship and that person takes advantage of them as a young age, um, lies to them, cheats, steals, takes, all of these life situations and events, what they do is something really powerful. They start to form an idea of who we think we are about ourselves. So that child that's got the learning disability that can't figure out in school starts to think to himself or herself that I'm stupid, I can't learn. And guess what happens? That same mind frame carries on with the child for years and years and years and years to this very moment. 
So the standard that I'm stupid and I can't learn wasn't created out of this. It was created 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And that's where the standard was set. Some people go through life being abused or going through pain, neglect, trauma, all that kind of stuff. Maybe they tell themselves that I'm not good enough. I don't deserve to be happy. I deserve pain, all that kind of stuff. They set a standard for themselves then and there. And now in life, whenever they experience anything opposite of that, they don't see it as real. They, they, they do everything they can to make their reality conform with the standards they have. When you, and, and also the, the thoughts, the beliefs you have about yourself. I mean, there's some powerful stuff. So it's not just the fact that you create this identity. You believe that it's true. You believe that it's true. And um, it also then that tells you what you can and can't do. So once you create an identity, set your standards and have a certain belief in yourself. And from that point on, you're going to believe what's true and what's not true. I mean, point blank. It's, uh, I could tell you this, that everybody watching this right now, there are stories you tell yourself about yourself, about who you are, um, how you got to where you are right now that a lot of them are based not in the here and now, but based in the then and there. You've set and created standards for yourself that are not true, but you keep telling yourself you're true. So what do you do with these limiting beliefs? As a human being, what do you do with your limiting beliefs? Well, first, you have to become aware of them. So my suggestion to anyone watching this is to go write down what beliefs do I have about myself? What standards have I set for myself? And just make a list of these. And then what you have to do is you actually have to sit down. So this, uh, this is the real work, man. This is what family members, you have to realize that if you're trying to um, provide more support in the recovery process of your loved one, without doing your own work first, it's going to be practically impossible. Because what happens is all of your own stuff comes into the relationship with your loved one. And when that happens, it dilutes the relationship. So the same way we're telling your loved ones to work on themselves, work on their life, uh, focus on themselves, all that kind of stuff like that, so they can have a better relationship with you. We're telling you the same thing. I'm not saying anything different to you than I told it to your loved ones this morning. So what you have to do is you have to identify all of the limiting beliefs that you have about yourself. You have to identify all of the standards when you set them for yourself. And then you need to challenge those with massive action. So an example that I shared this morning and I'll share with you is... When I moved back here to the United States when I was 16, 17 years old, I wasn't a thriving uh, high school student. So I barely, you know, I, I just went through classes. I didn't get really good grades, very, very mediocre, very, very average because I was smoking a lot of pot through that process, right? I was smoking a lot of pot through that process. And if you smoke a lot of pot and smoke a lot of weed, it's really hard to, to thrive in the educational system. After I got out of High school, I tried to go to community college and I did okay, but then I started flunking out and failing out and getting F's and getting withdrawals because I was drinking a lot of alcohol. I was using illicit substances. I was partying all the time. I was staying up late. It is impossible to thrive in the educational system with the massive addiction that I had. Okay? So when I, you know, through the process of my uh, early 20s, I was saying, yeah, school's not for me. I'm too stupid. I'm too dumb. I can't figure it out. It's just, I, I'd rather go do something with business and all that kind of stuff like that. Till eventually, so I set some standards for myself, right, of who I think I am. Eventually, I went back to class. I went back to school at, at 25 years old. And the reason I went back is because the life I had sucked. I was depressed. I was sad. I was down. I felt lonely. I felt, you know, um, that if I don't do something different about my life right now, I'm going to struggle for the rest of my life. You know, so these are all thoughts that I had. And I went back to school. And my first, you know, first few weeks of class, I sat in the front row right by the door. And the only reason I did that is because I truly wanted to always leave classes. If the teacher was boring, I left. If there was a break, I never came back. So I sat by the door to always have an exit route. And after a while, I said, if I keep doing, if I leave these classes, I'm always going to be back to the same stuff. So I, you know, I said, I'm going to try something different. I changed my standards. I sat in the front row in the middle by some students that I never would have sat by before. Instead of with the kids at the back that were all smoking weed and, and, and leaving classes, I sat with the kids that actually were invested. I sent some emails to the teachers. I 
uh, let them know, hey, I'm really interested in this class. What can I do to do better? After the midterm happened, I didn't get the grade I wanted. I said, hey, what can I do to get a better grade on my final? I started co connecting with the people sitting next to me, getting their phone numbers, going to study groups with them. I started to participate in my own educational pursuit. By the end of that semester, I got an A in that class. Okay? Now, all of a sudden, my, my limiting beliefs had a, a, a chink in my armor because here's this. I had one version that I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I can't take classes, I can't finish, and I have one version over here that I just got an A in the class. Which one's real? Which one's real? Version A or version B? Because you know what? They're both real. Now for the first time in a long time, I had a choice on what standard I want to, I want to pick for myself. Same thing with you family members. If there's a version of your life that you've continuously lived over the past few years, that no matter what you do, you try to support your loved one in a certain way, it doesn't work. You try to, um, you try to support them in a different way, it doesn't work. You try to reach out to X thing and do this, that, set this, blah, blah, blah. Whatever your story is with your loved one, if you've tried a bunch of different ways to deal with their addiction and recovery, it doesn't work. Try working your own program. Try doing your own work, try connecting to your own people, try figuring out who and what you are as a human being, when and where you lost yourself. Try to learn how to set boundaries, try to honor your boundaries, try to deal with your own emotional process, find out what's the root of your sadness, your anger, your frustration, your possible anxiety, get to all that. And then when you do so, you'll have two versions of yourself. The version that gets walked over by the loved one, that gets lied to, manipulated on, cheated with, that gets taken advantage of, or the version that's strong, that's solid, that's healthy, that's, that's confident, that has boundaries, that doesn't have guilt, doesn't have shame. And all of a sudden, for the first time in your life, in your recovery, you're going to have two versions of yourself. And you're going to get to choose. Which one do you want? Raise your standards, change your life. This happens in the recovery process too. Raise your standards, change your life. You got to say, I will no longer accept the standards I had before. And massive action creates it. So <clears throat> the next one right here that I have is, uh, and when you're trying to raise your standards, you got to be able to, um, you become who you surround yourself with. So I know this talking to a lot of family members, addiction of a loved one is a very lonely process. How do I know that? I've talked to enough moms and dads to know that when their loved one at first starts using drugs and alcohol, they, you know, they go around the, the, the average ways of just lying for them, covering for them. So there's a big family gathering. What they do is they say, hey, yeah, Johnny just wasn't feeling good today, so he stayed home. Or if, you know, if there's another event going on over there and Johnny you know, stayed home or, or, or used a lot of drugs the night before or overdosed or whatever the heck it was, they just say, yeah, he's studying for a final exam. He just couldn't come today. So at first, the family members start to lie about the addiction of their loved one, which I'm sure a lot of you have done. And then after that, the family stops going to spend time with other family members and their friends because they just can't lie anymore. They, they can't tell them the truth because we feel like we can't. And second of all, they just don't want to go lie anymore because it's happened so many times. So they stop hanging out with their friends and their peers and their support and their loved ones, right? And eventually it starts to get really lonely and it starts to get really isolated. How do I know that? I've talked to enough of you. So you stop surrounding yourself with people. You stop getting support. You start going inward and thinking and overthinking and analyzing and all that kind of stuff like that. And I'm telling you, if you're trying to change your standards, you must surround yourself with human beings that understand where you are that have gotten out of where you are and can show you and tell you how to get from where you are to where they are. Because if it's not those people, then who? Do you really think your family can pull you out of the embarrassment, the shame, the guilt, the anger, the anxiety of depression when they haven't been there? The only people that have the ability to do so are people that have been there and have gone out because they can grab you and pull you out and tell you what it takes to go from there to there. So you got to surround yourself with people that have what you want, that you're attracted to their recovery. You're attracted to the way they carry themselves, to the way they um, communicate. You have to surround yourself with that. How do you do it? Well, that's what the power of these support groups are. Self, th this group right here, there's 
So many family members, by the way, just on the side chat that I know that have gone from where some of you newer family members are to where, um, to where they are. And if you are, please write, you know, if you want, if you want other people to reach out to you, just say, Hey, you'd happy to tell them what your journey was like, because there's so much value in that journey. There's Al-Anon groups and Naranon groups. So there's people that have been from where you are in the pain of the first initial stages to not feeling that way anymore. And there's value in that. You must surround yourself with those people. You know, they say we become the, the sum of the five closest people we spend the most amount of time with. So if you don't spend time with people that have what you want, you're not going to become what they are. Um, and there's, there's only two more things I have here that I think are relevant to this is, is each one of you watching this right now. Uh, this one says, by the way, to raise your standards, you have to do whatever it takes to do whatever it takes. And, and I'm not going to water that one down because doing whatever it takes is something that most people think they know what it means. However, um, yeah, thank you, Debbie. I appreciate it. Um, this is a, this is hopefully a community. Yep. There you go, Denise. This is a community. Uh, you guys have been watching this for a while. I know, um, You've been really faithful and supportive of this. And there are some new family members. I know that just logged on last week for the first time. So um, if you are open to receptive to providing support feedback to those families offline or whatever, feel free to do it. I mean, that's the whole point of this. You know, my talks are just a, uh, hopefully an introduction to something greater than myself or, or, or these one hours. But doing whatever it takes, my friends, most people think they know what it means, but they don't actually use it in practical application. So if you're trying to raise your standards, you have to do whatever it takes. So let's just show you, let me just tell you what that means and how easy it is, by the way. So everyone watching this right now, I know that you have a to-do list of things that you should do, that you need to do, that you've been wanting to do for a while. I just know it because you're a human being. And some of you have procrastinated on, have avoided, have not taking actions or steps to completing that list. Fair enough. Now, if I tell you that we can all go on an all expense paid trip to Greece, uh, Mediterranean, the cuisine, the food, the airfare travel, just put COVID aside that we're going to do that. However, in order to go on that trip, you must complete whatever to do list you have by the end of tomorrow. By the end of tomorrow, you have, by the end of the weekend, you need to complete that to-do list. Guess what will happen? Something magical. You're going to probably just get off the line right now. I mean, you're not even going to listen to the rest of this talk. You're going to shut your computer. You're going to go and say, okay, these are the 10 things that I've been needing to do, wanting to do, should do for the past few weeks, few months, but I haven't. I need to go make this phone call. I need to write this letter. I need to call this creditor. I need to, um, I need to, reach out to this family member, whatever it is, you have this list that you've just been sitting on. And when there's an opportunity for something that excites you in the future, all of a sudden you find the motivation, willingness, enthusiasm, effort to do that. Now here's the thing. If you're trying to raise your standards to change your life, you got to do whatever it takes. Now, if you're trying to raise your standards, to be a supporting uh, element, a supporting factor in your loved one's recovery and, stand, and, and, and that kind of stuff, you got to do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's scary. Sometimes that's difficult. Well, if we had that all expense pay trip to Greece and you had 10 things on your list, I bet you some of those things would have been hard. Some of them would have been scary. Some would have been difficult. But you would have found a way to do it. And I know how much all of you moms and dads and, and brothers and sisters and stuff like that, I know how much you love your loved ones. There's no, there's no secret there. You're obsessed with them. I mean, you're so, a lot of you are so codependent that um, it just bleeds through you. So now are you willing to do that for yourself? Are you willing to go to any lengths for yourself in your own recovery to raise your standards and change your life? You know, um, and the very last one, this one, this happens more with the client. This one really hit the clients and the, the program participants harder because this, the, the topic of this one is in order to change your standards, raise your standards and change your life, you have to step up and you have to give more. Okay. Most people, I'll tell you this about addicts, alcoholics, they are constantly thinking about themselves. 
They are constantly thinking about what they can get out of a situation, why something isn't fair to them, why they should be doing something different, how this is a waste of their blah, 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 blah. They are constantly going through that stuff. And by a product of doing that, it sets their standards really low, right? Now, the opposite of this is instead of thinking about self is to think about others. And I know for some of you family members, you're like, dude, that's all I do. You know, so you got to find a balance with that. But what happens is this, is when I start thinking, how can I help the next person? How can I be there to support the next person? How can I give more of myself to someone else? How can I um, be of service? All of a sudden, the act of not thinking about self opens up an entire universe of possibilities. In that universe of possibilities, our standards start to come up. We start to feel different. You know, when I had this talk this morning with some of the more, um, when I had some of this conversation with the program participants this morning, I said, if you're sitting here just, uh, excuse my language, but bitching and complaining about certain things, I want you to get out of that just for today. Go be of service. Go help someone. Go do something. If you have three weeks sober and someone else has 10 days sober, put your arm around them and say, hey, my name is so-and-so. You're welcome here. This person's cool. Here's my phone number. Reach out to me if you need me. I'll come check up on you later. And by the process of going through and doing all those things, right, going through and doing those things, what happens is magical. You'll start to realize, hey, I'm really grateful that I actually have the chance to be here right now. I'm grateful that I get to reflect on my life and think about this. I'm, I'm happy that my family's supporting me through this process. Um, and the only way the person got from feeling bad about themselves to the point of feeling gratitude wasn't because they changed the way they think. Because we all know it's hard to change the way you think with your thoughts. When you want to change your thoughts, you got to move your body and take some actions. Because a person that moves can change the way they think. And so step up and give more focus on focus on giving more than getting. And uh, yeah, thank you for um, thank you Denise for the, the kind words over there and, and for all of you guys. You know this was this was really cool. So um, in, in summary, what I talked about today and, and I'll and I'll get you out of here was I talked about if you're trying to you need to ra you need to raise your standards to change your life. So I, I know I've said that over a thousand times today, but. When, I, when you get off this talk, I want you to keep hearing Parham's voice saying, I need to raise my standards if I want to change my life. There is a little bit of psychology in repeating words over and over and over again in a course of 42 minutes because that's how things stick. You know, that's how things stick because I do believe that if you're watching this talk and, and, and about 12 or 13 of you watch the entire time, uh, you wouldn't be doing that if you weren't trying to change something. So... I'm telling you that if you are trying to change something, you got to start with raising your standards. How do you do that? You change your shoulds into musts. Go write down all the shoulds that you have in your life. Just right after this, go write down all the different shoulds that you have. Take a look at them, take an honest look at them and see which ones you can change to musts. Because must has a sense of urgency to it. Must has a certain level of power to it. Must has a do, almost a do or die to it. Which ones can you change from should to must? And after that, just know that you have to be able to realize that the beliefs you have, the standards you have, are not something that you created in the here and now. You set them a long, long, long time ago. You set them a long time ago. You created a set of standards, beliefs about the world, about others, and to this day, you're still believing them. You got to really look at that and see, are the standards I set as a child the same standards I have today? You know, if I felt like I wasn't good enough or I don't deserve this as a child, and, and if I'm still saying that today, why is that, why is that the case? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the condolences. Um, and the last one was, the last two were, you confront your limiting beliefs. So when you do identify some standards and some limiting beliefs that you have, you have to, you have to attack them with massive action. You can't just say, okay, this is the way it is. You got to take contrary action to those beliefs. Eventually, over time, it creates two different experiences. Then for the first time in a long time, you have the ability to choose which one you want. The new standard or the old standard? Oh, the new standard or the old standard? You're going to have a choice. And uh, to do whatever it takes, that's the grease analogy. You have a to-do list right now of things that you should do, you need to do, you are supposed to do. And for whatever reason, you've procrastinated, avoided, um, put off for an extended period of time. 
But if I told you right now that if you complete that entire list, we can go to Greece for an all expense pay trip, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get off this and go complete that whole list because the, the outcome of completion is worth it to you. Now, why don't you find things in your life that are more important than that Greece trip that are so valuable to you that no matter what list you have in front of you, you're excited, motivated, and engaged to complete it. Imagine what will happen if you do that. And the last one is to step up and give more. I know a lot of you family members already give more, but uh, maybe give more to yourself. That's a different take on it. So instead of giving more to everybody else around you, maybe you start giving more to yourself and start investing in yourself a little bit. And uh, all that being said, you know, it's 45 minutes. I love and appreciate you guys. I just went back to back on the same talk with the same level of intensity. Um, so I hopefully we'll see all of you here next week. And by the way, this last thing, I created this little thing. So if you go to uh, my, my Facebook page, uh, it's just par, uh, Param, Param Nimatola, uh, you'll see this little idea that I have, and it's called the One Minute Therapist. So actually, if you go on YouTube, you'll, you'll be able to find my channel. It's the One Minute Therapist. I just started it two days ago. It's, I've gathered all these clips that I've had for you, and I've changed them into little one minute sections. And in those one minute sections, I provide some type of inside awareness, all that kind of stuff like that. So go subscribe to my YouTube page. Tell me what you think about the one minute therapist. Uh, and the whole concept behind it is if, if somebody can ruin your day by you know, turning, cutting you off in traffic or saying something mean to you or giving you a dirty look, then why can't somebody improve your day, your thoughts, your feelings, your actions by saying something that resonates with you and actually makes you feel good. So hopefully I try to do that one minute at a time, but let me know your feedback. It's in a beta process development. I just started it. I'm pumped about it. Uh, yeah, go subscribe and follow the one minute therapist. Uh, love and appreciate all you guys. Thank you so much for all the kind words and all the condolences. Uh, we'll see you guys next week.